Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the site event of the Summit of the Future. No future without culture. Reflecting and imagining on the place of culture in delivering the pack for the future. This is organized by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign. This campaign brings together representative global and regional arts, culture, and heritage networks united in the understanding that there needs to be a greater focus on culture in development agendas in order to realize its potential to drive positive change. We believe, we are convinced that collectively, arts, culture, and heritage sector practitioners, institutions, and policymakers not only help guarantee fundamental cultural rights, but play a determining role in achieving development goals. No future without culture. We have a strongly welcomed recognition in many of this year's voluntary national reviews on SDG implementation that for development to be sustainable and effective, it needs to be culturally informed, culturally relevant, and culturally powered. For this to happen, culture needs to be seen as a distinctive goal and area of action. This site event, dear colleagues, this site event of the Summit of the Future will give voice to key actors committed to deliver specific actions on the place of culture in delivering the pact for the future. We have a great agenda. Now, I have a pleasure to invite Stephen Weiber, Head of Advocacy of the International Federation of Libraries, Associations and Institutions, IFLA, member of the steering committee of the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, to take the floor and to present our most recent activities. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jordi, and thank you to all of our speakers and to our, panel, our participants for joining us here today. It's fantastic to be able to um, be bringing the message, bringing some of the work that we've done, but I think more importantly, bringing the work of our partners and of, under, of the member states, of the governments, of the stakeholders who have already recognised the significance, the power of the arts, culture and heritage in order to drive development. And hopefully through this webinar, through our broader activities, we can get to a stage where that importance, that role is far more broadly recognised and it becomes an integral part of the UN's work. So I wanted to, as I said, rather than simply state things that, that we have produced or that we have shared, I wanted to share some messages that come directly from the sorts of, from the materials and voluntary national reviews that member states have been sharing this year of their implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Because I think that rather than us producing nice documents and nice statements, this is really, these are concrete, this is concrete recognition of that importance of what is possible when you integrate culture fully into development strategies. So for example, we can take, we can take the model of Uganda, which makes a key point about simply the role, the importance of the culture and heritage sector for e economic growth. It's a driver of dynamism. It's a source of job. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a driver of social mobility within countries. But looking beyond this, we have this as a perhaps more traditional approach. However, we also see the understanding, the recognition that culture has a huge role to play in building societies and building cohesion. This is a message that is reflected in the current draft of the Pact for the Future, noting that we need to think about culture if we want to think about collective action. We need to think about culture if we want to think about resilience. And this is a point that was made very clearly by Austria, which offered extensive experience, experience extensive evidence about the role that this plays in helping include, helping build connections, helping build social capital. But we can go further than that. I think a really excellent example comes from Vanuatu, and I would have used examples from Palau, but we're honoured to be joined by a representative of Palau later on today, so I do not want to take words out of his mouth. Um, but for example, the Voluntary National Review of Vanuatu underlined that beyond the contribution that culture, that arts, culture and heritage make to growth, 
beyond that contribution to social cohesion as well. It's also vital to have culturally informed policies, that it's not that culture is a goal in itself, but crucially, culture is an enabler of the effectiveness of policy approaches, the effectiveness of implementation. And I think this connects extremely well with this broader theme that we're exploring at the Summit for the Future. How can the multilateral system get better at delivering on its objectives? And we would certainly argue it is through such culturally informed, culturally relevant, culturally powered initiatives. And then the final quote I wanted to share, which echoes very well with certainly the goal of the campaign, is from Mexico's Gantry National Review that underlined that has really extensive consideration of this role, of this importance, and concludes that the best way of taking account of this, the best way of making sure that no country is leaving culture behind, that in no country is culture just being neglected, overlooked, looked at in a purely siloed manner, but rather we need to have both a specific and a transversal integration of culture into any future development agendas. So these are these aren't our words. These are the words of member states that have already done things correctly. Now, to move from words to numbers, the analysis that we carried out of the voluntary national reviews presented this year underlines, firstly, the multidimensional aspect of culture, the multidimensional contribution of arts, culture and heritage to achieving the SDGs. So we worked through the SDGs. We looked at how many of them talked about culture as a pillar of development, as a determinant of success, as included culture indicators, talked about the role of culture in promoting the SDGs in general. And you can see that in each of these areas, there are references, some in stronger than others. But I think in particular, the fact that almost 25, so two thirds of voluntary national reviews recognise that culture is a determinant of success in achieving the SDGs. We can look at culture as contributing across the 2030 agenda. And this is important. A key characterising factor of the 2030 agenda is this focus on how interlinked different policy areas are, that we can't achieve success in one area without success in the others. And what we can see from the data is that countries are also recognizing this. They're seeing that if we want to achieve progress on equity, we need to think about culture. If we want to achieve progress on education, we need to think about culture. And in particular, if we want to build stronger communities, more peaceful societies, stronger democracies, we need to think about culture. And so culture really is, it's a cross-cutting factor. It's perfectly in line with the idea of an integrated policy agenda. And then finally, we use the text of our proposed zero draft of a culture goal, which we'll talk about a little more at the end of this. Um, but we've come up with this. And this was a, a document produced at the time of Mondia Cult 2022, and aimed to actually think about what could a culture goal look like to make things more concrete. And so we also analyse the voluntary national views this year against this set and once again, we see that actually all of these different dimensions, they're already being recognised in so many places. This is not a new idea. This is not a dramatic new in in invention. This is something that when governments think hard about what they need to do in order to achieve sustainable development, in order to achieve their policy goals, they need to include culture. So it's in there. It's a feasible thing. It's a desirable thing in order to make sure that every country is doing this. But all to say that a culture goal definitely is, it can be achieved. It is on, it, could, it must be on the agenda. And then finally, just so you can note down and, and maybe screenshot this one to, to have an idea, but we will also share the link to this in the chat. These are the elements which I think echo. These are the things that you saw on the X axis of the graph on the previous page. Those key, those different dimensions. Again, underlining the role of culture as a multidimensional contributor to development, as a cross-cutting to contributor to development, as well, of course, crucially, as a goal in itself in terms of promoting the importance of cultural rights, promoting artists and promoting local cultures and artist mobility. So um, all to say, there's a strong evidence base. We're not talking about anything dramatically new, but certainly what we're looking forward to now is hearing more about from the people who are on a day-to-day -day basis incorporating culture into development, showing what a future with culture can look like. Back to you, Geordie. Thank you very much, Stephen. It was, it was very complete, succinct, to the point, and covering both our Culture 2030 Goal campaign, say, in-depth analysis of the voluntary national reviews and the voluntary local reviews that we have completed in 2019, 2021, 2022, 23, 24, and everything is on our website, as well as our Vault Advocacy, let me put it this way, 
the need for a culture goal. It does not damage anyone. On the contrary, it boosts, it multiplies, it empowers everyone directly or indirectly related to cultural rights, cultural policies, and sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Now, the word is for the world organization on education, science, and culture. It is an honor to welcome the director of World Heritage, Lazar Elundu Asomo, to take the floor. Lazar, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, Jordi. It's a great pleasure uh, seeing you again. And uh, good morning to uh, I mean to everyone from where you are. And uh, here is the afternoon in Paris. Uh, now, let me just sh share with you uh, uh, some perspective. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I, I, I want to start really uh, uh, to uh, acknowledge the, this uh, wonderful uh, Culture 2030 Goal Campaign. Uh, which is a critical initiative uh, that seek to uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, do justice uh, to culture. And as I said, to elevate culture as a key component for uh, uh, sustainable development. As you know, uh, UNESCO has long been a, um, at the forefront of, uh, of this uh, effort and this movement. Uh, uh, advocating for the recognition of culture as a global public good and a crucial pillar for achieving uh, long-lasting uh, development. And uh, this event that we're having today fits squarely into uh, uh, our organization's broader mission, which is, of course, to elevate the importance of culture in global policy discussions. And we are here to uh, contribute to continue advancing uh, that vision. And I thank really uh, uh, all of you, the organizers, for uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, we uh, we are together with you uh, and uh, and that we are contributing to this important uh, dialogue. Uh, Jordi, uh, and uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Stefan, you, you guys did mention uh, uh, Monja Kult. And uh, one of the key milestones in, in this effort was the unanimous adoption, of course, of the Monja Kult 2022 uh, declaration. And uh, you know that, uh, and I'm, I mean, those who are listening to us, that this declaration uh, broadly recognized, as I already said, culture as a public uh, good, but advocated also for uh, its integration as a specific goal in its own right in the development agenda beyond 2030. And we maybe we all agree that this is very important here, but this was a true turning point that reaffirmed the indispensable role culture must play in shaping uh, a sustainable and resilient uh, uh, future and I was very inspired by uh, the uh, the uh, slides that uh, uh, Stefan just uh, shown uh, 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 when he was uh, doing his uh, his introduction. But yet, despite the progress we can say we are making and we have made, we must also acknowledge the gap that remains within the current uh, 2030 agenda. Uh, I think the absence, and we think I hear at UNESCO that the absence of a specific culture goal has unfortunately uh, limited uh, the potential for culture to fully drive sustainable development. And we can we 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 have seen it, and all of us in our different domain uh, have seen it not only on uh, uh, the work of UNESCO, but in uh, the wonderful work everyone is doing. Uh, uh, who are part of, uh, of, of, of this uh, com uh, campaign. Many actions, uh, as a result, have not been able to harness their cultural capital to its fullest potential, uh, leaving untapped uh, opportunities for localized development, and I think equity and resilience. So the, um, 
the UN Secretary General's rescue plan for uh, people and planet has also underscored this need, identifying the absence of culture within our sustainable development strategies as a, a significant barrier to achieving the SDGs by and beyond uh, 2030. So culture is not just an enabler of sustainable development. It is foundational to many of the goals we are striving to achieve. Uh, I can give one example. Uh, uh, UNESCO's forthcoming framework for culture and arts education 2024 uh, will illustrate how culture directly impacts quality education. Likewise, culture plays an essential role in creating decent development, advancing environmental sustainability, and fostering social inclusion. So th the evidence is clear. We know that countries such as uh, Canada, Ecuador, and Palau, as reported in their uh, uh, VNS, uh, and I think, uh, 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 Stefan, uh, you, uh, you already started uh, introducing this, but also the, the, the voluntary uh, local reviews. These countries have already demonstrated how culture is making tangible contributions to uh, many of the SDGs. Yet, without formal recognition of culture's role within the global framework, we all know that its potential remains limited. So this is why, uh, as I said, uh, the Monjakul 2022 declaration is not just a statement in, of principle, but, but it's a call to action. And uh, it calls for the protection and, and promotion, first of all, of cultural rights ensuring that everyone has equal access to cultural participation and creation. The declaration underscores culture's role in fostering peace, stability, and resilience. And we have many examples of that. And while the declaration also uh, addresses some of the most pressing global challenges, such as uh, climate action, digital transformation, and the protection of cultural heritage in times of crisis. So support for this agenda continues to grow globally. If you remember- One, one minute more, Lazar, if you can. Yes, um, and one minute more. The, the last G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration, the BRICS in Johannesburg the Declaration, uh, the uh, statement from uh, the G7, the G7 and 7 plus China and many others reaffirm this importance. And uh, 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 we know that uh, the inclusion of a standalone goal, and I wanted to finish with that one, uh, uh, in the post-20 agenda is not just a matter of advocacy. Yeah? I mean, it's a necessity. And uh, uh, this goal definitely will empower the nation to implement, you know, inclusive, Policy. So I know, and I'm pleased to announce that the journey continues with the next Monja to 2025 to be held in your city, in the, in the Barcelona. So it will bring together uh, many people to continue advancing uh, all our integrated uh, uh, policy. So in conclusion, I, I, I want to say that uh, uh, we will work closely with all partners, including with uh, the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign to shape the future where culture is both a driver and a sustainable development. And I really take this opportunity to call on all global leaders, policymakers, cultural institutions, let's come together. Together, we will ensure that culture takes its rightful place in shaping the pact for future and that it plays its rightful role in fostering inclusive resilience and sustainable world. And I'll finish that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lazar. We fully share your your uh, affirmation, your your statement. Let me let me say that one some of the we are not in the negotiations of the Pact for the Future. We were not, not directly. We 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 are not invited. But we know that 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 some of the signatories to the G20 great uh, statement in 2023 
on the need to explore the culture goal. We're not happy to have that explicit mention in paragraph seven of the Pact for the Future. So this is something uh, we have to, to be explicit and we have to work hard to convince those that hesitate because one day, 23, they say one thing, uh, 24, they thought uh, in the other direction, but yeah, we have work to be done. Um, let me also a technical note. There is another Jordi Pasqual in the in the in the in the room. Okay, uh, not anymore. <laughs> this is solved. Uh, now, Chief Sylvester Francis Alons, government of Palau, uh, involved in the uh, writing of the voluntary national review of Palau to the high level political forum in 2024. One of the strongest voices on the place of culture in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Chief, you have the floor. Hello, good, good evening. Uh, I apologize in advance, but can everybody hear me okay? I just want to see some, okay, so I see some nuts. Yes, Ali, we, can, good we can listen to you very well. Okay, that's, okay, that's perfect. I apologize in advance. Uh, good evening from Palau. It's quite late and I did not realize that my setup at home does not have a camera. So I'll just have the seal of the ministry here. But again, uh, good evening to everybody here. Thank you for joining. And actually, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, to, to say thank you for this invitation. I understood that our UN mission was uh, had people reaching out, uh, admiring the, the inclusion of culture into our VNR. And uh, it's, it's timely that this invitation arrived because I think a few weeks ago, our VNR, our secretariat's team at the Ministry of Finance held a debriefing with the stakeholders. So they invited members of the delegation to join. So we were able to replay the VNR for our stakeholders, for those who weren't able to watch it live uh, due to the time difference with Palau. And uh, in those discussions as well, there was this appreciation that culture was there. So I'm here to sort of elaborate on the approach and uh, the lessons that we learned and observations we made uh, to take more from these discussions of culture from my colleagues and uh, counterparts from uh, international organizations or perhaps other VNR teams. So I guess I'll begin with a little, a little background to understand the logic behind the inclusion and then the structure that we did and the values that uh, the secretary team and really the minister who presented our behalf really enforced. So as you can see from the seal that I put in place of my photo, I come from the Palau Ministry of Human Resources, Culture, Tourism and Development. Uh, the ministries may change and that's true for most places, but for the, minute, for the moment right now, this is the organization we're in. So I'm actually from the Office of Human, Sur Human Resources with the Youth Division, which was another priority. So I'm going to link the two to match my mandate and then also match the structure that we use for the VNR. When uh, the Secretary team reached out to the President of Palau and his cabinet, he made it clear that he had an interest that there be a meaningful youth component so the selected uh, honorable minister of health said that means that we should have a young person to serve as a presenter there. They reached out to our ministry and then I, uh, I took the lead on this and I nominated the chairperson of our National Youth Council, uh, uh, which was a local NGO to sort of to both uh, achieve that goal of having a youth speaker, as well as have a, uh, of course, a young Palan woman enter and learn about the space. And then lastly, uh, take uh, perspectives that she had to offer as chairperson of the National Youth Council. So really the point I wanna emphasize there is that when we had these meetings and had these deliberations, when we were looking at everything, at one point they said, we should invite the chairperson here so she can be involved in writing her own remarks as well. Maybe she has input here. And uh, of course, many of the adults in the room, I say that as a young person myself, many of the adults in the room were mentioning points on you know, like our weaknesses with indicators with culture or how it's there's a struggle to when it comes to the preservation of language or other means or what does it mean at a ministerial level versus what the community 
and the NGOs and stakeholders value, but then it was our young person who suggested that her focus would not only be youth and then youth priorities, including uh, uh, priorities of Palauan youth in Palau and the Palauan youth outside. So I'll make the connection in a second before I finish my opening. She emphasized culture there. She said, as a young person living in the world, when I think of developments in Palau, I would think of how do I develop a Palau that is inclusive of unique values that stand out? And how can these values uh, inform development in the country? So, uh, so that was her point, obviously. So she made her remarks, of course, uh, for the purposes of the VNR, uh, following our protocol suggested that we uh, include a traditional chant to really uh, e evoke that sense and then set the tone for the VNR so that the themes around development are people centered. And I think that's the, I think that's the central point we make. It's people centered. So, so what do we have for a VNR for, of, of course, many people have watched it, but to, to put the illustrated one more, once more, you have the Palau Minister of Health with a delegation composing of the Ministry of Human Resources and Culture and the chairperson of a national youth council. So together, these people came together and said, okay, in the scheme of development in Palau, I think across party lines, development means improving on the hum on the person, that development efforts are, are people-centered. And the, the challenge of culture for Palau and many Pacific islands is, I'll, the simplest way I could put it is a question I posed at many side events and uh, other bilaterals we had as the chief of the youth division, which was the question I posed saying, why are youth leaving paradise? And what effects does that have on our development efforts? And I think that's a challenge that I'm okay sharing that many of my Pacific Island uh, brothers and sisters uh, would articulate that in the scheme of the VNR and uh, VLRs for some countries, we're working as one, on one as well. There's this consensus that it's difficult to understand why you're developing a country using uh, using, the SDG, using the SDGs and indicators for a population that's constantly migrating, seeking uh, for various reasons, but more or less seeking a better quality of life elsewhere, whether they move within the, within the country, within the Pacific, or, some, or in the case of Palau, outside of the Pacific. For, a, for the youth division and for young people in general, the question is uh, that mobility, its effects on culture means that preserving culture is more than simply having indicators or having the ministry dictate indicators and work across uh, the lines. It actually means what's a meaningful way to use modern technology or to use modern means of connection and uh, modern networks. So the buildup to this was actually timely as well. So we at the youth division have been working to connect with the wider Pacific region and the Pacific Youth Council. And by the time we arrived at the VNR, this, uh, this was a real opportunity, at least for the National Youth Council and our office to really elevate it to the ministerial level and say, well, unlike many of our neighbors with the Ministry of Youth, the cultural component here is the focus of young people. And I would say that's true for most people who live here and those abroad. So it was a momentous, um, so it was momentous there. So I'll conclude again by saying, it was, it was a culmination of work across many sectors and many people in the secretariat but uh, it's really heartening to know that this is here. So I'll convey the, again, I'll convey my gratitude here and then say, I will report this all to our director at the Bureau of Culture so that she knows that her input was also valued. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvester. Thank you very much, Chief. A pleasure to, to have you in this panel and a pleasure to work long-term with you. Now the floor goes to Marcus Reiman, the co-director, executive director of the Thyssen Bornemitza 21 Art Contemporary, one of the leading international arts and advocacy foundations created in 2002 and based in Madrid, working in several cities around the world, Venice, Jamaica, uh, with an activity fundamentally driven by artists. Uh, TV21 has been thinking on how they could 
better contribute to 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 this connection uh artistic creation uh sustainable development local development uh so it is it is a, a pleasure to give the floor to to marcus to explain where they are why they feel an interest in this uh, culture goal in this campaign uh the floor is yours thank you very much uh, for the introduction jordi and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak on this uh, on this panel. It's uh, incredibly meaningful to us as an organization, and I'm really humbled by the inclusion into this uh, very distinguished speakers list. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, as you said, I'm one of two directors of, of uh, the Contemporary Art and Advocacy Organization, TDA21, um, that works on the intersection um, of contemporary art in transdisciplinary um, ways, uh, always collaborative, always led by artists. Um, and for more than 10 years, we have been looking uh, deeply, deeply into the ocean as an arena, the ocean as a, as, a, uh, as a cultural arena as well, or different cultural arenas, but also as the, the, for the ocean as a conceptual tool to really untether us from land-based linear binaries and think with fluidity and think with change as um, we're currently facing uh, the convergence of, of a poly crisis, we all know, um, but this poly crisis uh, has uh, by now um, a number of runaway effects in its systems. And uh, we have found that um, the usual approach to to um, to solve these complex systemic issues uh, with first degree mechanistical solutions has not necessarily worked um, and uh, and therefore we do believe that the inclusion of artists in these processes that create not only or that that uh, should lead to decisions but also to lead to constituencies, not only amongst uh, scientists, policymakers, um, social scientists, and so on, to come to good decisions and, and maybe um, maybe uh, visionary decisions, but also on the other side, no, um, how to communicate, how to how to disseminate um, these decisions into um, an engaged constituency that is part of the co-design process. Um, and we've we've found that um, artists are partic contemporary artists are particularly equipped um, in holding these forms of complexities and these forms of polyvocal uh, constituencies um, because we give them this this special um, place in society where they don't have to immediately come up with a product with a solution with a something that is uh, that is straightforward and, and kind of based on a on a transaction, no, it's it's very often a uh, process is very often uh, collaborative co-design uh, and so on. So that that is that is the one thing. On the other hand, where we do absolutely advocate for um, you know science based uh, science based policy making and, and knowledge based policy making, we uh, have realized, and I think there's now more and more um, uh, there's now more and more evidence from neuroscience. As well, that is, it is not necessarily uh, information that leads to action. There is not a linear line from information to action. I think I think we can all agree because we now see um, often political will, sometimes not political will. Um, but but um, I think the the science is relatively clear. Yet we don't see enough action. Um, neuroscience tells us that um, it is actually empathy, context, and meaning that creates a way shorter pathway to action than just pure information. And I think this is really where the role of, uh, of art and culture um, is, uh, is crucial, because if it does not uh, create exactly that, if it's not a, a moment for us to become empathetic to the situations that are expressed by artists, if it's not a way for us to get emotionally engaged in, uh, in the quests that, uh, that we're all facing, then, um, then I don't know, and um, and and lastly, I think in this in this uh, very abstract hyper object of climate change, uh, environmental crisis, uh, societal crisis, economic crisis, and so on, we know 
what the transition is. We know what uh, what the what the things are that we have to do, or the things are that we should not do, but we don't necessarily know and imagine the place that we want to inhabit. And we very often turn to science to model the place that it might be in a best case scenario, worst case scenario, and so on. But we don't fill this with imagination. And so therefore we have this incredible group of, of, uh, of human beings that we have let um, train this muscle of imagination um, all their lives. And we've given them this special place that we now call, call culture. And um, yet we don't engage them in these processes at all. And so therefore, I could not uh, agree more that the culture in itself needs to be a sustainable development goal for all the many reasons that have already been um, been mentioned and also backed up by data, no? by, by data from the ground. So this is not somehow abstract, but it's really from the ground um, to make uh, the, the actions and the, and the knowledge meaningful, uh, locally grounded and therefore effective and, and, and carried by a large constituency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. As you, 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 you know, you all know that the campaign has promised to deliver a more in-depth version two of the culture goal proposal by mid next year. Everyone invited. This needs to be a collaborative work and we are committed to, to involve TV, uh, 21. I must also uh, mention the great work of Nicolas Garbi, a uh, member of the team of, of TV21. And let me also mention here the names of, of three cities that are strongly advocating for a, for a culture goal, including Strasbourg, which in, in its voluntary local review has chapter 18 devoted to SDG 18 culture. Let me also mention Lisbon and Braga, representatives of these cities, Claudia and Joana, uh, attending the webinar. Um, now the floor is to Keba. Keba Dafe, uh, he's wearing four hats, International Music Council, Arterial Network, UCLG Culture Committee with Segu, winner of our award in 2020, as well as, say, the, the, the hat he wears uh, daily, as director of program and partnerships of ICAM, the Segu Foundation. He's in the chat, but he's recorded a, a video for us. Uh, Stephen, can you play the video, please? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kiva Rafi, Director of Programs and Partnerships of the Foundation Festivals of the Niger, which co-founded the Creative Segu program with the municipality of Segu, UCLG Member City, and winner of the UCLG Mexico Culture 21 Prize in 2020. Today, I want to show you how culture, deeply rooted in our traditions, can drive profound change and sustainable development in our societies. In African tradition, culture is much more than art and heritage. It represents our collective spirit, it shapes our values, the way we speak, the clothing we wear, and how we interact with one another. It's an invisible force that unites communities and guides us to difficult times. It's a compass for how we live, work, and dream. 25 years ago, Sibu was a small town without electricity, without infrastructure. Today, Sibu is not only Mali's cultural capital, but it's also recognized for its creative Sibu program. With a population of over 150,000, Sibu sees this number double each year during the first week of February for the Sibu Art Festival in Niger. And people come from over 35 countries to this specific place located 200 kilometers from the capital of Mali to experience giant concerts on the bank of the Niger River, contemporary art exhibitions, theater, dance, workshops, masterclasses, conferences, traditional performances, and much more. Over the first 10 editions of the festival, it has injected more than $30 million into the local economy and created more than 3,000 jobs, including 200 permanent jobs each year. This concrete impact illustrates our contribution to SDG 1 and SDG 8. In Segu, culture is much more than just an expression. It's a lifeline. And since the onset of the security crisis in 2012, which has unfortunately shaped a lot of what people know about Mali, this festival has become a symbol of resilience. And it has never missed a year. Uniting communities across Africa through its project, the Cultural Caravan for Peace and Diversity, providing a sense of hope and continuity in these uncertain times. 
and beyond resilience, it has promoted peace, solidarity and social cohesion amongst the different communities of Mali and beyond, which perfectly illustrates SDG 16. We've taken the lessons learned from this festival to transform our community with future generations in mind, particularly through our educational programs. In Sigu, we use art, theatre, traditional storytelling and sketches to teach our children their role and responsibility in our society. This is more crucial than ever today, as we try to shape the next generation of responsible citizens through our Maya and Citizenship Program SDG4 and our Youth, Environment and Creativity Program at the Koya Cultural Center SDG7, SDG14. Moreover, our Art and Wash Program, founded on our Art and Maya for Social Change approach, has improved the living conditions of over 120,000 vulnerable people in terms of safe drinking water, hygiene and sanitation. SDG6, when you observe our culture, whether it is to the vibrant rhythms of the Koa or to the imaginary of our traditional art, you are not just an observer, you become part of the story. And this is the power of culture. It connects, it transforms, and it propels us forward. Like right now, it allows us to come together from all over the world to imagine a shared future. If you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, it's evident that culture has a vital role to play. Through our cultural programs, we've contributed to at least seven of the current SDGs, promoting quality education, gender equality, decent work, reducing inequalities, sustainable cities, peace and strong institutions. Culture here is not just a catalyst, it's the foundation upon which all these developments stand. So without recognizing culture as a standalone SDG, we miss the opportunity to harness its full potential. I endorse the 2030 Goal campaign when it regrets the Pact for the Future should have included a clear mention for a future culture goal as a central consideration to enhance the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. We need to move beyond seeing culture as a backdrop and start acknowledging culture as the stage on which sustainable development plays out. From the town of Segu, we say, and I quote Mahmoud Afe, president of the group Korea Iron Culture, culture is the solution. Thank you very much, Keva. Thank you very much to, to you, to all the team, to the great work that you're doing in, in SEGU. Let me now invite uh, all participants to to raise questions, to write those questions in the in the chat. While you are writing those questions in the chat, uh, we still have 15 minutes before we conclude. We have to conclude at uh, 11 in the evening, Palau time, 4 in the afternoon, Barcelona time, 10 in the morning, New York time. So in, in 15 minutes, we have to, to close this, this webinar. Um, let me say something which is a bit embarrassing. Uh, you have only heard men. And this is embarrassing, very embarrassing. Uh, Reality has gone in this direction. We had foreseen with Stephen and with uh, the other members of the campaign to, to guarantee uh, gender balance in the number of speakers. Uh, we regretfully do not have with us the Minister of Finance of Ecuador, Ms. Saria Belen Moya Angulo. We don't have Lili Pandeya representing the Ministry for Culture of India. Uh, we had other uh ladies representing the their uh, institutions but we have failed and i insist this is shameful our fault uh, i beg your pardon um let me uh, say hello to also members of the campaign uh, that are in the in the room members of icomos members of the international federation of coalitions for cultural diversity members of Culture Action Europe, that together with Arterial Network, IFLA, UCLG Culture Committee, and the International Music Council are the seven members of the steering group of the campaign. Let me also say hello to Anupama Seha, representing the International Federations, International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies. I do not see questions in the chat. Uh, I see Edgar from uh, Mexico, Edgar Ramirez. Uh, and Stephen, you have your, your hand is, 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 is raised. Do you want to take the floor? 
I, I, I would actually, um, and this is certainly a, a question for the other panelists, but I think we've heard from, from, from Keba, from um, other speakers, from Marcus, um, about the importance of, of that recognition of culture as a goal. And, and that's clearly something that isn't happening with the Pact for the Future, although certainly it is meaningful to have in such a high level document, this, this recognition, this, this starting point. And so I think, you know, let, let, let's be positive. Let's think of what we can build on from there rather than necessarily regretting what might have been. I think one thing that we are thinking about within the goal campaign is what is the next step as clearly um, the, the, the pact for the future looks to be a sort of action plan. There's 58 different actions, but an action plan needs a roadmap. There needs to be an implementation model going forwards. And so I would certainly be very interested to hear from the other panelists, what suggestion you might have, but what's the most immediate step that we can take based on this recognition of the power of culture within societies as a driver of development to really try and move up a gear, to move us towards that situation where at every level, in every country, in every continent, culture is integrated into development plans. Marcus, do you want to answer that question? I, I, in in one know, minute? Um... In when, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean it's a very, very, very difficult question, no? Because because I mean we we know the challenges around the world in in, in different countries where it comes to, you know, freedom of speech, um, the access to public spaces, um, and so on. So I think I think the question the question is, and you're doing exactly that, no? You're building the coalition, you're building momentum, you're growing the coalition. I think. Um, that that is that's the way to go, no? To to kind of, um, and I think, um, I think there was a there was a mention in the chat earlier, no? Is that it's about the the long term vision on the one hand and the measurement, no? Uh, and the the question the question of what is the measurement, and we're still very often stuck in these KPIs, no? That we've that we've seen earlier, and they produce uh, uh, culture produces produces um, measurable. Um, uh, benefits, no, like like we heard earlier, um, the uh, the creative industries and and so on. So there's uh, there's economy uh, economy, there's engagement and so on. But what it does, and I think this is what we're that this is what we're talking to, and and currently the measurement tools um, do not um, uh, do not include this. Is kind of we need warm data, no? We need the data about the about the connections the relationships the ideas and so on that culture actually triggers uh, because that underpins resilience that underpins longevity and that underpins a myriad an abundance of of new uh, creative possibility possible solutions right um and and this kind of reliance on warm data reliance on on long term measurements and so on that's what we don't don't have no we have kind of we have economic drivers we have people through the door we have uh, people engaged in educational programs and so on but but the relationship the the relational as, uh, issue aspect of of the question that leads to resilience that um somehow is not is not encouraged so um, I think we need to we need to take that into account. I'm not sure that it's the most uh, uh, urgent issue, but I think if we want to make a better argument, that could be one way. Otherwise, I think you're doing a fantastic job in building building the the the, the coalition and building the momentum. Sorry, that wasn't a minute. Almost no. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you. Sincere, uh, sincerely grateful. Um, Edgar, you have been promoted to to as a speaker to raise your question. Can you make sure this question is 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 uh, succinct in thirty seconds? And if you can say to, to to what person this is addressed? Well, good morning. Uh, here from Mexico, and my question would actually be um, directed to all of the speakers. Um, We've seen that um, recently there's a, there's a divergent opinion between conserving or preserving um, our cultural heritage 
versus competing against um, other others nations or other cultural heritage from other nations and the main the main topic here would be how can we um, contribute to the future with um, with not competing but also um, feeling of uh, a sense of complementing each other's uh, contribution to culture as a, as a worldwide uh, notion and not just a national conservation attitude. Thanks, Thank you. Paul. Thank you, Edgar. That was clear. Perhaps this question could be answered by Keba or perhaps Celia in your conclusions. You can, you can address that, that question. Um, it's only five minutes to four here in, 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 in Barcelona, five minutes to 11 in Palau, five minutes to 10 in New York. If you do not mind, Lazar, do you want to answer to that question? And then we give the floor to Celia for the conclusions. Uh, thank you. I don't know if I will be uh, able to completely answer the questions. I think the 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 what I would just say is that uh, I think the whole effort that uh, we are now putting in the pact for the future actually will uh, will set uh, the roadmap, and uh, I mean the, the will give us the path towards uh, trying to structure all what we we want to achieve. Naturally. Uh, each of us will have some responsibilities to uh, to to work uh, uh, in this direction, but we will have achieved a first important step, which is actually not the end, but the beginning of all the efforts that we are doing. In particular, for us as a, a, a UNESCO, now we have to continue mobilizing, you know, uh, the ministers of cultures on our side and we, we we want to i mean i think it gives us a good direction for the next mundial uh to meet in uh in uh, in, in in barcelona so uh, 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 i think continue to work on uh, effective development policies it's something which is uh, fundamental at least so that we can continue to uh to to build the the, the, the enabling environment for uh, all what we want to achieve uh, around the role of culture. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lazar. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Stephen. Uh, all what you uh, are seeing is mainly the today the great work of Stephen. He wrote the VNR uh, compendium in 2024. And he's been leading the organization of this of this webinar. Thank you very much, Stephen. Always a, a great pleasure to work with you. Celia, do you want to take the floor for the conclusions in two, three minutes so that we can be sharp at uh, four o'clock Paris time? I will be happy to do so, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Jordi. Thank you very much, of course, to all the speakers of today's uh, side event of the Future Summit, which was organized by the Culture 2030 Goal campaign and which aimed to give voice to key actors who are committed to deliver specific actions on the place of culture in delivering the pact for the future. We started from the UNESCO Mondial Cult Declaration of 2022 which sets the aim of a standalone culture goal. And we then went on to celebrate, really celebrate the good practice uh, from countries which have already made culture central to their approach to development. We strongly believe that practical examples and evidence is what convinces policymakers. Therefore, the insights that were gained from reviews of SDG implementation at the campaign made a lot of analyze, analysis of these. Uh, we heard examples from Uganda, Austria, Vanuatu, Mexico, Canada, uh, which are important as they underline the tangible contribution of arts, culture, and heritage to economic growth, social cohesion, and other policy areas. And in this sense, the very practical experience we heard from Palau and the focus that they shared on the need of 
people-centered development was extremely enlightening. And this is what Lazar also said, evidence is clear. Now, what to do with this evidence? And Marcus from TBA 21 reminded us that we don't know or we don't imagine the place we want to live in the future. And that turning to science does not give us all the answers and that we need to fill this place with imagination and we can do this thanks to the work of artists. From the city of Segu, and thank you, Keba Dafe, uh, we learned how SDGs are being implemented locally because culture is being put in the driver's seat and contributes to local economic growth, local job creation, but also to peace and social cohesion across the country. These contributions of culture are recognized in the Pact for the Future in its version 4, Action 11 which calls for a stronger integration of culture into economic, social, and environmental policies. We cannot repeat it often enough. For development to be sustainable and effective, it needs to be culturally informed, culturally relevant, and culturally powered. For this to happen, culture needs to be seen as a distinctive goal and area of action. It's actually very simple. There is no future without Culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celia. Also, a great pleasure to work with you, together with you. Um, and this is the this is the end, colleagues. We 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 carry on. Uh, Cornelius, I missed your question, but uh, we promise. Uh, my fault because I was not looking at the chat. Um, the preparation of the version two of the culture goal proposal will begin soon. Uh, let's make sure, Cornelius, that this question is one of the first we address, and we invite you all to this to this process uh, to be as collaborative as it was the elaboration of of uh, draft zero in 2022. Uh, Stephen, um, do we close? Do you want to say the final word? I'm, I'm 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 very happy for you to have the final word. I'm I'm just I want to say thank you so much. I think just there's so many such powerful, articulate um explanations of why this matters so much. I think I don't know we are uh, we're we're making the right arguments here. I think we have a good cause. We've got momentum. I'm positive about the future. 